Hello and welcome to Jerry Beckert's webinar presentation discussing the employee retention credit. I'm Sarah McGregor, your host for this afternoon, and I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items to uh, let you know. <clears throat> Down in the handouts pod, uh, in the gray command strip on the right hand side of your screen, there is, a, you can open that by clicking on the uh, triangle to the left and there will be a copy of today's slides if you'd like to download that. Uh, you can grab that from there. Uh, you can listen to the broadcast through your computer or through the telephone. If you will go up to the audio tab, you can choose that there. You'll also see a questions pod. If you have questions for the audience, uh, please put those in the questions box and we'll get to as many as we can today. There's been a lot happening in the world of the Employee Retention Credit, or ERC, as we frequently refer to it. And so we're going to catch you up. Uh, for those that are new to Employee cred Retention Credit, we'll have an overview and then uh, move into what is the latest information. So today, let me introduce our presenters to you. Uh, Deb Walker, you can see her there on your screen. She is our uh, as a uh, tax director with our firm. She's our national director for compensation and benefits planning for, for tax. Uh, and Martin Karaman. Martin is a principal and he works in our tax advisory services team specializing in credits and incentives uh, from the federal tax side as well as employment related taxes from the uh, state side as well. Uh, and I'm your host. I am a director and work with our federal tax uh, team. So today we're going to cover, as I said, a quick overview of the credit so everybody understands uh, is on the same page with the terminology and how it works. There's been a great deal of new law and guidance that's come out in the first three months of this year. Well, really end of December and, and here into uh, March of 2021. And then we're going to hit some key areas where we have received new guidance, uh, where we've experienced some um, uh, some work with some of our clients on areas that have brought a lot of questions and we'll talk about that particularly about how to monetize the credit for the fastest money turnaround what's going on with with uh, m a and with portfolio companies and private equity and of course hot topics uh, and finally kind of a walk through what you could expect if you uh, are trying to maximize your benefits from this credit what's involved there so Marty, I'll turn it over to you and let you give us an overview of the credit itself. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, yeah, we're going to do this in a way that will cover everything, as Sarah said, from how this began, how it evolved, and some of our, I guess we'll call it like stories from the road, I guess metaphorically anyway, as we talk to a bunch of clients about, about how they're approaching this. But the employee retention credit was originally part of the CARES Act. Um, I think it was passed March 27th last year. It was effective back to um, March 13th of uh, 2020. And it coincided right when COVID started to hit. And its intention is to subsidize companies that um, are uh, harmed in one of two ways by COVID. They're either harmed to the extent they have some significant decline in their gross receipts, um, which would be essentially attributable to a lack of a customer base due to COVID, people having stay-at-home orders, things like that, but also if your business directly was impacted by government orders as well. Um, that would be one, the, the, the two ways that you can um, that you can qualify for this credit. To the extent you do, then the rules um, allow you to calculate a payroll tax refund that oftentimes is in excess of what um, you would, what you would calculate from, uh, what you would owe from, from a payroll tax perspective. With that said, though, last year under the CARES Act, if you took the advantage of the PPP program, you were statutorily prohibited from taking advantage of any ERC benefits whatsoever. That changed at the end of last year um, under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, where Congress retroactively allowed companies that hadn't even thought about whether they were eligible employers for purposes of the employee retention credit uh, because they took PPP, go back and take a second look at that and potentially apply for refund claims of their payroll tax. Um, additionally, Congress extended the incentive into 2021 for the first two quarters at a 70% on the dollar rate for the first $10,000 paid to any employee while you are a, um, while you're an eligible employer. Uh, and previously for 2020, it was only 50 cents on the dollar for the first 10,000 for the year. Um, 
in the 2021 rules, that was changed to be the first 10,000 per quarter per employee, meant it, which meant that as, as at the beginning of this year, we were looking at maximum benefits for companies of $5,000 potentially per employee, to the extent you qualified, up to $14,000 per employee. And then under um, the American Rescue Plan, this credit for 2021 was it extended into the final two quarters of 2021, meaning that a company that qualified could potentially recognize benefits equal to $7,000 per employee per quarter, meaning a maximum of $28,000 per employee. Um, again, the credit is a, um, a credit against employer social security taxes. Um, and all of these are ultimately reported on either a 941 for payroll tax purposes or a form 941X um, from a refund tax refund claim perspective. Why don't we move on to the next slide so we can talk about this a little bit more. So again, I alluded to this, but in order to qualify for this incentive, you have to be what the statute defines as an eligible employer, meaning um, either you're suffering from a decline in your gross receipts, and that means for the 2020 credit, um, a greater than 50% decline in your gross receipts in any quarter of 2020 compared to that same quarter in 2019, or in 2021, it was liberalized and made a little easier to pass um, only a greater than 20% decline in any quarter in 2021 compared to that same quarter in 2019. It's important to remember that the comparison year is always 2019 that we're going back to. Um, it is the year prior to COVID. So we want to compare back to a year before things were, um, I guess, made less than normal, strange, just disruption to the economy. Um, the other way to qualify, and I think this probably applies more in 2020 than it does in 2021 um, are companies that are impacted, disrupted, what the statute will call partially shut down due to government orders limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings. And so we think about things like stay at home orders, um, things where there were travel restrictions. And this is a very facts and circumstances discussion that we have with our clients to get a sense from them about what happened to their business and how they might have been limited and then trying to match that up with the numerous government orders from a state and local perspective with a few from federal with respect to some travel restrictions there. Um, industry perspective that really obviously hits something like restaurants and hospitality pretty hard, um, but it can hit any industry. And we'll talk about that in some of the rules, some of the hot topics I think that we've that we've touched on um, and, and what we've learned from our clients in the way that they're, they're approaching this. We can move to the next slide. The last thing to consider is that there are, what I'll say, enhanced benefits for small companies. And small is defined differently depending on whether it's 2020 or 2021. Um, in 2020, to the extent you had a hundred or fewer full-time employees, and you actually measure that back in 2019 again, um, on average, um, and you're an eligible employer, you can include the wages that you pay to every employee that you have. So this actually is uh, is quite a large incentive for smaller companies. Um, in 2021, that rule was, again, I would say, uh, liberalized and made easier and made available to more companies. It was a 500 or fewer full-time employees. So companies with um, 500 or fewer full-time employees, to the extent they qualify under either the grocery receipts or the government mandate test, can include wages paid to every employee that they have while they're an eligible employer. Um, if you have greater, if you're a big company, we'll say, and in 2020, that's again, greater than 100 full-timers or in 2021, greater than 500, the credit really lives up to its name. It is a retention credit and the amount that you can include in your credit um, calculation are, well, the amounts are um, amounts paid to employees for not providing services, meaning there's a disruption, you're keeping them on the payroll, they actually, either aren't or cannot perform their job right now. And instead of putting them on employment, the government is subsidizing you to keep them on the payroll. That also includes individuals for whom um, health plan expenses are being covered after they were furloughed as well. So that's a big change here uh, that increased to 500 and really important to keep in mind that the benefits are much bigger for what we'll call smaller companies as opposed to larger companies. And so, Martin, you really like to describe this as two different kinds of credits, or really is the 2020 credit is one and 2021 is really a different, even though they fall under the same name. The, the rules have changed, so. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they're both intended and, and 
to, to provide a refundable credit under the payroll tax regime, but the method, the rate is different uh, in the two years. The employee thresholds are different in two years. And uh, in, to some extent, some of the em employers to whom it applies is a little bit different as well. Um, there were some, for 2021, additional rules included for the last two quarters of this year with respect to some startup companies that didn't exist for 2020 as well. So it has evolved as companies have learned more about it and, and what they can and can't qualify for. The government has adapted a little bit and made it applicable to potentially more and more employees as it's, as it's gone through its three iterations since uh, a year ago. We had one question come in about the comparison of quarters again. So 2021, uh, first quarter that we're in right now would compare back against 2000, first quarter of 2019, not against first quarter of 20. Uh, yeah. But you could also look at uh, the quarter preceding, right, under the 2021 rules? You can. And that's a, that's a really good a really good nuance to this is that you can look at the current or prior quarter. So for right now, the current quarter is 2021. You would compare back to Q1 2019, but the prior quarter is obviously Q4 2020. You compare that to Q4 2019. So you're either doing a one-year look back if you're using the prior quarter or a two-year look back doing the current quarter, but it is always back to 2019. Now, as we move through the year, um, we're going to be looking at, you know, it's all going to be back to Q2 2021 versus Q2 2019 or the one before. The interesting thing is if you actually qualify on your actuals, uh, your actual Q1 um, results, you kind of by, de by definition will qualify for quarter two as well, because for quarter two, you can use quarter one. So it is to companies benefit to actually qualify on the actual quarter one, 2021 um, gross receipts, because that would get them two quarters. All right, and Deb, I think you're going to take it from here for a little bit. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the changes, but in December 27th of um, 2020, we had the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and they uh, increased these this employee retention credit. As uh, Marty talked about, they extended it to the first and second quarters of 2021. They also increased the pool of employers by allowing people that did pay, paycheck protection program loans. So the rule here is that you can't use the same wages, but you can use the same time period. So you'll see what we spent a lot of time doing is looking at payroll records person by person and allocating a wage either to PPP protection program loan forgiveness or to the ERC. And you'll see we have some guidance that was pretty favorable from the IRS, even if you filed your PPP loan forgiveness application and included way more wages than you needed on that application, you could still use those wages for the ERC, even though you put them on the application. And I think there were a number of state colleges and universities and then also hospital, uh, government hospital facilities that felt they should not have been left out. And therefore, we expanded the pool in 2021 to include these government entities, although most government entities aren't included. Um, as Marty said, we broadened the definition by increasing the uh, numbers of employers that qualify because you only have to have a 20% decline in gross receipts. And as we just mentioned, you can use the prior quarter for determining gross receipts. And then we increased the way Congress increased the wage base. They changed it from 100 or fewer employees to 500 or fewer. The, the base is 70%. The credit rate is 70% of your wages. Um, you don't have a, a rule that says the wages can be no more than what you would have been paid in the prior 30 days. So if there are bonuses in there, they can still count. And the health care rules pretty much stayed the same. So then cycle forward to the last change, which came this month. Uh, and that extended the credit through the end of this year. So now we have four quarters of the 2021 credit, first, second, third, and fourth quarter. Uh, IRS asked and received an extension of the statute of limitations for examining these um, filings. That is, the process is you're claiming the credit on an employment tax return. And of course, the IRS usually, ha usually has a chance to examine a tax return over three-year period. Now it's been extended to five years. 
They also added two new kinds of employers, but they're really very limited. The recovery startup business is one that was not in business on 215.20 uh, and has annual gross receipts of a million or less over the last three years. So then they, um, they capped the ERC at $50,000 per quarter per employer. And the other one is a se severely financially distressed business where you have a greater than 90% declining gross receipts. Those people can use, get the credit on wages paid to all employees. And, and the, those two, uh, those two new pools of employers, that's just for the third and fourth quarters of that's uh, 2021. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. And so uh, let's hope there we don't have some distressed businesses that are clinging to life, waiting for the third and fourth quarter. We hope hope everybody's yeah. recovered uh, yes, more right. substantially by then. Right. Okay, and just before this law passed, we had notice 2021-20, and this was a lot of the same guidance that we had already been working with on what was called frequently asked questions on the IRS website. There is a little bit of new guidance, which we'll talk about here, but the, the from a technical standpoint, the important thing is now the government, this is the official government position. They can't back down from this position, of course, taxpayers can disagree with something in a notice, but now we know at least what the government's position is beyond what would just be a frequently asked question, which really had no authority of law. So Marty, you mentioned about the um, partial suspension. You want to talk a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah, before suspension. we, we talked about this before we got on, the, I got on this presentation actually. So the one thing that's interesting, we'll see with a lot of companies as they think about whether they qualify is they'll have a fact pattern where Maybe their grocery receipts really didn't decline that much, but they can identify the fact that they were disrupted or partially shut down to some extent by a government order that affected a portion of their business, shall we say? Um, what's interesting there is, you know, there is if it's all one trader business that they're in, you want to make sure that like the, the portion of their business of, within that trader business that's disrupted is more than nominal as a result of the, these government orders, and so. The guidance clarified, at least from a safe harbor perspective, that what the IRS is looking for is that the disruption of the order on the part of the business that that is you know, partially shut down is that it's affecting more than 10% of the hours or gross receipts associated with the business in the prior year, again, back to 2019. So... One one example that I think Deb was fond of using earlier on before we got into this this year would be like something like the grocery store that has to shut down its um, its salad bar, right? And so at a restaurant, that's obviously a big deal. But at a at a grocery store, that might be a very very small portion of the business. And if that were the only limitation or government order affecting the business, it probably wouldn't really affect the overall trader business. It probably would be um, less. Or probably just a nominal portion of, of the trader business. And even though there's an order on it, it may, we may not be able to get to a position that we feel comfortable that that particular order is affecting um, and causing a shutdown with respect to the entire trader business. So what it's done is provided some amount of, um, I would say, calculation and quantification of either hours or gross receipts affected with or, or by, as a result of a government order affecting a business currently, and you do a comparison back to 2019 and see exactly how that order would would have affected you last year and what portion of the business that was. So that, that, that was a big deal just in terms of clarification. So, and it's important to note that this 10% rule is really a, a, D, a safe harbor rule that in some cases, if you do the calculations and you come out at eight or 9%, it might, you might still qualify as a partial suspension. It's really facts and circumstances and the government has given us a safe harbor where you will deem to be a partial suspension if you meet this 10% yep. rule. Um, and one of the other tricky things we have is wages paid by third parties, most commonly by a PEO, a professional employer organization. Um, the tricky thing with PEOs is that they're filing the form 941s, and this is the, the form on which the credit is claimed. So the IRS has provided that the employer can file a form 7200 even though it doesn't file a form 941. Now the 7200 is a one page form where you're claiming a credit um, based on the employee retention credit that you earned for that quarter. The form 7200 doesn't have to be filed. 
but if it is filed, it has to be filed before the 941 for that quarter. So if you're using a PEO or even an outside payroll service, we have to carefully um, coordinate with the PEO and our payroll service in order to make sure that they're aware that a 7200 has been filed and properly reflected on the Form 7941. Um, we now have, we, we meet with clients with payroll services and with their PEOs and determine dates of when we have to get the 7200 to the client, or if we're not using a 7200, when we have to get the data to the payroll company to claim the credit. Uh, we mentioned before that um, PPP loan, um, PPP borrowers can use uh, an ERC, can claim an ERC, but you have to carefully coordinate which wages are used for loan forgiveness and which wages are used for ERC. In general, you always want 100% loan forgiveness. It, to the extent you can have other costs, um, that's good. It frees up more wages, but in you have to have at least 60% of your uh, loan um, repay. The, the loan forgiveness costs have to be payroll costs. At least 60% of the loan forgiveness costs have to be payroll costs. As I mentioned before, if in fact you filed your application, then you can use wages that you actually included on that application that you did not need for forgiveness. But when you're making that calculation, you need to be aware of the 60% rule, and you can't add any expenses that could have been put on the phone form for loan forgiveness but weren't put on the form for loan forgiveness. So, Deb, real quick, just to add, like one of the strategies we talk about with our clients, right, as we get into 2021, is to the extent you're getting, you know, your PPP, um, obviously you can take both both benefits, but to the extent there is flexibility to associate. PBP funding with non-wage costs, do that as opposed to putting it all to wages to the extent you can, to the extent that's legitimate. That's, that's one strategy to make sure that you're maximizing your ERC. And Martin, um, there's a reason why PPP is better than ERC. Yeah. Um, and you want to address that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, PPP is always better because it's 100% coverage, right, of what you get. And to the extent you get forgiveness, essentially you've gotten you've gotten full funding for, for certain amounts of your expenses. ERC, well, I think the statute actually defaults first to ERC and you sort of elect out of it by getting PPP. Um, it is less beneficial, let's say for 2021, you're getting 70 cents on the dollar coverage up to a limitation per employee of $10,000 per employee. So I would always do our best to maximize um, PPP to the extent we are eligible for it and can take advantage of it. and then. Within that PPP, minimize the amount that goes to wage expenses. Then think about what you can get from an ERC perspective. Um, and then, you know, as you go down the line, um, when you take ERC, there's a few things you can't include. You'll you'll need to, we're working with our clients to make sure we're not double dipping and claiming things like when they do their research credit for income tax purposes, if it was if the if those wages were covered by ERC, then that's something else to factor away from the R&D credit, but the ERC is still is much more beneficial. Um, there are other um, payroll tax, like the FFCRA that came out last year. I think ERC is more beneficial there, um, but some of the new in, uh, new uh, grants for restaurants and also like shuttered venues are, are very beneficial too. But if I if we're going if top it down, I'd go PPP over ERC all the time, uh, but they can work hand in hand and we can work to maximize them both. Great. And yeah, so Deb, just before before we leave this, um, do we have any idea how quickly the IRS is uh, is responding to those 7,200 uh, uh, refund requests? Well, what we've been told is that it's two or three um, two or three weeks turnaround. You fax in the request, um, I, but I can't really tell you. You know, clients don't sort of come back and say, "Oh, we got our money from the 7,200," but with a PEO, it's really best to use the 7200 because then you don't adjust, take it as a credit from them uh, if you don't have enough payments that you're making to the PEO. Um, and the 7200 is cash returned. Right. There's, there's nothing like the speed of the fax machine in 2021. <laughs> so big, one, we have one more thing we needed to talk about on the prior slide. And that is the um, 
reduction of compensation or health benefits expense. Before I get to that, though, I want to go to the go back to the integration for a minute because what people don't understand sometimes this is an employee by employee calculation. And so what we find out is as we work through these calculations, it's usually the higher paid employees that get included in the PPP loan forgiveness. And a lot of the part-timers have um, ERC on their amounts. That's because we can take 10,000 away from those higher employees, higher paid employees, get the full amount of ERC for them, and the rest of their wages up to different limits, $46,000 if you're using a 24-week covered period, $20,000 if you're an owner, those, thing, those limits come into play. The other one that I saw just this morning, one of our uh, preparers was working on it and realized that there were no uh, health costs that had been included and that he wasn't, he, that there was still more room to claim ERC for some of these employees. So when we got the healthcare cost benefits, it was an additional $4,000 credit for the client because by adding in the healthcare costs that had not been included in PPP that could be included in ERC. And now the tax deduction, which people tend to forget, um, the amount of your compensation expense or health benefit expense, it does get reduced by the amount of the credit. It's just called a no double dip um, provision. And people are very upset with this because those credits for the 2020 ERC are going to affect expenses on a 2020 tax return. And yet people are filing amended returns in order to get the money. And amended returns are hand processed. So as the client said to me earlier this morning, so I just mail it into the government and I'll see it sometime in my lifetime, right? <laughs> I said, right. <laughs> um, but people don't expect the amended forms to be processed very quickly. Now we go to gross receipts for taxable entities. Uh, gross receipts is a really broad definition. It is the um, accounting method that you use for in your income tax return. So a completed contract or any of those things is what you would use. Um, you don't get to reduce sales by cost of goods sold, but you do get to reduce um, capital assets sold by their basis, which is a favorable rule. Uh, I don't think there's anything else. You do get to return by uh, sales by return, decrease them by returns and allowances, but. And Deb, you said that uh, unfortunately for not, uh, for tax exempt entities, uh, they're not able to reduce uh, the basis of assets sold. Is that correct? That's interesting because, yes, the tax exempt entities, Congress changed the law, had the tax exempt entities define gross receipts based on how they complete their Form 990. And I think Congress felt this was a pretty easy way to look at things. The problem is that it's um, much, it's, it's not as defined and not as favorable to the taxpayer as the taxable entity rule. Specifically, we have tax exempt entities that invest marketable securities and sell them. And each time they're sold, it just goes more and more into their gross receipts um, because they can't adjust for basis. So we have talked to the IRS about this and hopefully they'll make a change to make it um, consistent. Also, a lot of people think that um, for tax exempts that amortization of mortgage costs or discounts or any of that uh, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be included in gross receipts. But uh, under the provision which Congress included to find gross receipts, they would be included. The only thing not included would be um, volunteer services, so actual cash. And, and we take the position, although it's not at all clear, that pledges are not considered um, received and therefore don't have to be included, although under the statute, pledges are included. I'm hoping we'll get some more guidance on that too. Great, and uh, Martin, just before we go to the, our next um, discussion point, uh, we've had a number of questions, just clarifying uh, the tests are quarter by quarter, right? Yeah. Um, you have yeah, to look it's not, at the quarter yeah, it's and qualify right. that quarter. Yes, it's gonna be, it's it's a matching principle, right? So it's going to be quarter one, 2021 compared to quarter one, 2019. They go through that and that applies to 2020 as well. It's always quarter by quarter by quarter compared to those same exact quarters in 2019. So if you qualify in that quarter, you could skip. Uh, so you could qualify for um, 
uh, the third quarter of 2020, and then again for the first quarter of 2021, and uh, then that qualifies you for 2022. I mean, the second quarter of 2022, and then you might skip third quarter and or something. In other words, it's not. It's once you're in, you're not in for every quarter. You have to test each time. That's correct. I would say generally think of it this way: from a gross receipts perspective. Uh, for 2020, if you're in for one quarter, you're definitely in for the next one. Same thing for 2021. If you're in for one quarter, you're definitely in for the next one. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's that simple. But again, for any, the rule in 2021 where we'll be mostly focused is you can use your current or your prior quarter compared to that same quarter in 2019 to look for a greater than 20% decline. All right. And the, the rule in 2020 you have to have a 50% decline, but then you stay in your as a as an eligible employer until your gross receipts get to, a, to only a 20% decline. So if you have a 52% decline, you're in for that quarter. If you have your next quarter is a, is a 30% decline, you're still in for that quarter. And then it's the following quarter. Uh, it, it stops the year after the year in which you have a 20 percent decline only a percent decline so um once you qualify and if you're slowly ratcheting back up you might get three or four quarters three quarters for 2020. should we talk about controlled groups yeah. because it's important when you're testing these gross receipts that you look at your entire controlled group and the controlled group is basically a more than 50 percent ownership test so you look at what your entities are, parent subsidiary, um, uh, parent subsidiaries, if they're all corporations, more than a 50% test. And then if you have other than corporations, there's an interesting nuance. So if you have partnerships, S-corps, um, trusts, then you have to be a trader business. You can't, so what happens is that you may have a um, fund which invests in lots of businesses, such as a private equity fund. The fund itself, if it doesn't do anything other than invest, then that would not be a trader business. And that's not part of your test. You look through that fund and look to their shareholders to determine what the what is owned. And then run the parents, uh, brother, sister tests. So, and these are these can be pretty complicated tests when you start looking at uh, common ownership of the owners and then look through to see common ownership of entities underneath. Uh, and, and, and you sometimes come with a more than 100% ownership when you're running the test because you have uh, preferred ownership and carried ownership and all of this stuff. But and, yeah, and then you have these other other questions about management functions and things of that sort that that fit right. together as well. Right. All right, let's uh, look at employee count. Sure. This is incredibly important, again, right, for determining whether you're a big or a small company, whether you can include all the wages paid to everybody if you're qualifying as opposed to just those paid to individuals who aren't providing services. And so the test, again, is to identify if you had 100 or fewer full-time employees in 2019 for the 2020 credit or 500 or fewer um, in 2019 for purposes of the 2021 credit. Um, Again, what we're looking at here is you look at each person. You don't look at pieces of people or, or you know, you never have to put two people together based on the amount of time they're working. It's really look at each person and to the extent that one person in the month of, in each month of 2019, um, average at least 30 hours of work per week or 130 hours of service in the month, you do your calculation of every, all the people that met those thresholds in January, February, March, et cetera, through the end of the year add that up together and divide by 12 and you're looking at an average amount so this this comes up a lot because we've had some companies that get pretty close to that 100 even that 500 amount um, and it is important uh as best you can to do it accurately to make sure you don't get in a position where you're over counting what your what your benefit might be if you were actually at 101. i think that's an area where the irs will take a hard look to make sure that companies on the edge there um, did that calculation correctly and did it on an average perspective the one thing though I would say is that don't count yourself out even if you're over that 100, 500 threshold. There are still benefits potentially available to you. We do identify individuals who aren't providing services, specifically people who were furloughed 
Were you making those payments, the health plan payments for furloughed employees? And I also like to think back in the days of the early days of COVID when it was really unclear exactly how it would long or how long it would last or how uh, a company would adapt to that. There were individuals sitting on the bench and getting getting a full pay uh, for a period of time, probably especially in those first two months. That's that's an area that's probably good for us to put ourselves in the mindset of, especially if we were claiming PPP and never thought about it before. So while we may have adapted today and we're not paying anybody not to work, there may have been a time when we were, especially when COVID first hit. We can go to the next. All right, so monetization. Um, we talked about that a little bit, but um, I'll talk about a few things here, a little different than the slide does, but what's important to keep in mind is like, how do we monetize this credit? The way we monetize it ultimately is through the Form 941, whether that's an amended Form 941X for the 2020 credit, credit or reported on a currently filed Form 941, um, ultimately where it will be reported. If we don't report it and we get it for 2021, there'll be an amended Form 941X, but we may have the interceding or preceding Form 7200 to get an advance on that. We are focused a lot on monetizing that credit. Those credits will oftentimes, as I mentioned, be in excess of what your payroll tax liability might be for the whole year. Um, so the, the way that companies will think about monetizing this is having those credits calculated, say at the end of this quarter, or the beginning of next quarter, and then thinking about reducing the amount of remittances that they provide to the government through their payroll provider based on how big their credit is. Additionally, for companies in 2020 that deferred payroll tax half of it employer portion of payroll tax half of it into toward the end of this year and half of it in the end of next year that credit for 2021 can ultimately offset that deferred tax liability associated with 2021 from 2020 so if you're sitting there with that this is a good thing to think about reducing that deferred tax liability that's going to come due at the end of the year keep in mind as well and i made some reference to this but we will look at amounts that go toward the research credit um, to the extent covered by a to the extent covered by uh, ERC essentially those, those wages that go into the research credit calculation are ERC eligible we'll take them out of the R&D credit um, additionally to the extent a, a company claimed um, FMLA and sick pay leave and got credits for that with respect to a person we'll make sure that's not included in the ERC calculation as well uh, but again this is this is going toward technically a credit against the employer portion of OASDI Medicare. Um, but then in terms of monetizing, there actually is the potential to take it against not only what you normally would have remitted for the employer portion of payroll tax going forward, but also potentially with the amount you collect from on the employee portion, and that can be used as well to monetize. Um, that was a lot a mouthful there, but uh, we are keeping monetization in mind. It is intended to, at, at, the earlier you do it, to allow companies to get the cash in hand and not have to wait to go through the government to send them a check back if you can get the work done ahead of time. So for those employers that qualify here in the first quarter of 2021, uh, it may be too late to, to uh, adjust their payroll deposits. Perhaps we still have a little bit of time before the end of this month, uh, but definitely knowing that they qualify the first quarter of 2021, we know they're going to qualify for the second quarter. So definitely that can affect uh, beneficially the cash flow that they would be making payroll deposits in the second quarter. Yep, that's right. And all of it's going to be worked out with your payroll provider or if your PEO will be a little bit differently as well. But uh, that is one area of service that we're definitely consulting on with our clients to make sure that they can adequately monetize quickly. Great, great. And um, it does include the employee's federal income tax withholding and all the employer and employee social security. So it's all the tax, federal taxes that you would send to the government. You, instead of sending them, you just retain them and don't wait for a check from the government. That is the fastest way. The next mm -hmm. fastest way is the 7200, which can be filed as many times as you want during a quarter. As many times. Uh, well, Deb and Martin, you know, businesses don't stand still. Things have still been going on. And uh, what about those weird situations where we've got a company that we either acquired in the middle of the year or we disposed of? How do we deal with that? Yeah, this is a good question. And what I liked about this, and really when I started working in the ERC, because I had a history doing the research credit, is a lot of the rules mirror the way that the research credit works. And so the rules are similar here, at least from a safe harbor perspective. Um, 
to the extent a business, let's say in mid 2020, acquired another business. And at the end of the year, let's say for quarter four, it's counting up its gross receipts compared to what it was a year ago. Um, the intention really is to pretend, we'll say, to keep it easy to explain, pretend the company owned the business that it acquired back in 2019 as well, and count those two trades or businesses together at, in order to compare where it is today. Then it's really like an apples to apples comparison, as opposed to a false increase in gross receipts by virtue of acquiring another business. So that's that's the way the statute is intended to do it. Within the notice, it specifically talks about this with respect to um, gross receipts and acquisitions and dispositions. It's less clear whether it does with respect to employees. I believe it does with respect to employees as well and how you do your employee count. Um, but but we are mindful of that. Um, it comes up quite a bit actually, more than more than I thought it might have. Um, and so it's uh, it's easy to calculate. It's easy to figure out. But uh, and we have we have the expertise to do what we're doing a lot in the research credit world. So we'll we'll do it here as well. And the same thing applies on a disposition. You would uh, yeah. subtract out those uh, receipts in the earlier period for the company you, need, you no longer have. Exactly. All right. So hot topics. Um, this is this is a little, hopefully, a little conversation between Deb, Deb and myself. Um, and a lot of this we've touched on as well, but. Let's talk about it, Deb, you and I, like a little bit, ERC in the private equity context. You did talk about this with respect to the control group rules. Um, and oftentimes, probably more likely than not, more often than not, shall we say, probably to safer words, is that a um, in the private equity context, the different portfolio companies, at least the top level, um, that are brother sister across, across the ownership there, are often not treated as aggregated together due to the fact that the fund itself is not in an active trader business most of the time. Um, we'll take a look at that from, an, from, an, from a, I guess, structural purpose or st structural perspective. Um, but that's important in the PE world because it, these different portfolio companies should be thinking about this and looking at their businesses as if they're separate, as if they're not owned uh, by a fund, um, as if they're separately owned trades or businesses, just thinking about themselves and their and their direct subsidiaries in that case. Would you agree with that, Deb? Yes, and and uh, this rule about only counting entities in a trader business. I mean, when I look at the organization charts, if I have a fund, I just blank that fund out of the chart, and I look at who owns the fund and put them down as the direct owners of the portfolio companies. And it's uh, that rule has been around for years, and I think it's a 1981 Supreme Court decision. They got into uh, when is an investor in a trader business? And um, the case, the courts say it's a facts and circumstances decision, but certainly if all you're doing is buying and selling businesses, that is not in a trader business, no matter how often you do that. Now, some people out there are probably going to say, well, what about Sun Capital? Doesn't she know about Sun Capital? Yes, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, who had an underfunded uh, defined benefit plan determined that they could aggregate even though they were the fund owned two separate uh, owned two portfolio companies. Um, but the in that case it was very limited to just for PBGC, the pension benefit guarantee corporation rules and not the income tax rules. The court was very clear that this doesn't apply for the income tax rules. So I don't, Sun Capital notwithstanding, since it doesn't apply, we don't have to worry about whether these funds are in trade or businesses, unless some of my friends have told me, although I've never run into it, that sometimes they have funds which actually do a lot of activity that make it a trade or business. We haven't seen that, or I haven't seen that in any of the ones I've yeah. been alive. So we're getting a lot of, we're getting a lot of interest in the private equity space, just by virtue of the fact that, um, they really hadn't thought about this last year, and uh, and it's and it's open to them to take a look at. It's interesting as I look through our list of hot topics, we've actually covered a lot of it, but I'll just go through the list somewhat. Well, uh, we didn't uh, talk about. I, oh, go ahead. Why don't I ask a couple of questions that have come yeah, in associated better, with some better. of these topics, if that's all right? Um, so when it comes to the government orders and the partial shutdown, you mentioned about the figuring out if you had more than a nominal effect to the business. Uh, back to that uh, qualifying quarters, uh, is it the same rule applies here that if you had a 
partial shutdown and effect uh, due to government orders in first quarter of 2021, then you are eligible in the second quarter of 2021 for the ERC, or is that only applicable to the gross receipts test? Did that make so, sense? Yes, the, if you're under a partial suspension rule, the wages are the wages paid during the partial suspension. If you're under yeah. a gross receipts test, it's the entire wages paid during the entire quarter. So from that yeah. standpoint, the government suspension, and they end at all different times, October 13th. I mean, it, it's crazy, but. So you would have to yeah. have another government suspension. You would have to have a second government suspension in the second quarter to, to count during that, to figure out the wages eligible during that time period. Yeah, and that's, it, that's during, during the it can end in the middle of a quarter for a partial suspension. Wages okay. in the middle. Of a quarter. But the right. most important point here is if you have multiple orders on a business due to a geographic diversity of the company, it will begin with the earliest date of the earliest order, regardless of where, and end with the last date of the last order, regardless of where. So we are looking at orders across the board for companies that have multiple subsidiaries or business operations branches, et cetera, across the company. So if a, a company has an order in place still in California, but in uh, in South Florida, it's been lifted, they are still eligible because of that uh, impact on their business in California. I will caveat by saying, generally speaking, that is correct, but we will okay. take a little harder look to make sure it's not more than nominal. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then, um, uh, Deb, there was a question about employee owners getting W-2s do and and if they're a family or related folks getting W-2s. Um, any any thoughts on if that is affected by eligibility for the ERC? Right. Uh, related parties cannot get um, the ERC. So a related party is a 50% owner of a business, 100% owner of a sole proprietor, the spouse of those people, the um, children of those people, brothers, sisters, it's a very broad definition of uh, who's a related party for purposes of not being able to claim the uh, employee retention credit. Okay, um, and Deb, one more question for you about PPP loans and that interplay here. So if I had a $500,000 PPP loan and I put uh, reported back to them $600,000 in wages plus uh, $50,000 of other expenses, then I could use up to 150 of wages off of that application for ERC? That's correct, because you could use 50,000 for, for your $500,000 loan, you can use 50,000 of your other expenses, which is only 10%, and then you can use the 450,000 of wages even though you reported 600,000, you've got 100. But those other, those other expenses have to be on the PPP loan application, a forgiveness application, in order to be counted. I can't. That's I correct. Can't my mind later. That's um, correct. They have to. So we actually tell people if you haven't filed your application to hold up and let's finish the ERC. Uh, but with this favorable rule of letting you use even what's been recorded on the application, it's less important. All right. And uh, Martin, we have not talked about government contractors and ability to use, utilize the ERC. Is there, there, there's some question and hesitation about this in that, that regard? Yeah, I mean, I'll punt a little bit this over to Deb in a second, but I would just say this, that to the extent a company is exclusively doing business with the government, right? And they're doing their work on a time and materials basis, shall we say, right? Um, the government is not incentivizing companies that are, they're paying, basically paying for their employees, right? by virtue of that time materials arrangement. So to get a technical, while technically the company can't qualify for the employer retention credit, the government will often ask for the amount of the credit back in terms of uh, sort of an administrative charge reduction in the amount that they're paying across the board. So these credits for government contractors have to be analyzed with respect to how they're being paid by the government um, and what exactly how many employees are being paid in, in what fashion. So you may have some employees that are performing work on a fixed fee basis where the government technically isn't just compensating every expense and paying for the employees directly almost. Um, and so point being with government contractors, a part of the credit may have to be given back. Deb, when you want to fill in the yeah, next thing. That's, I really don't have anything to add. The other, okay. uh, we also have a lot of state grants and things like that that are funding 
and I don't, I mean, I think it depends on the language in the grant as to whether you have to pay it back. And I don't, the way the state grants work, it doesn't seem to me you do. To do that. Uh, so in our last couple of minutes here, Martin, uh, Deb, yeah. you want to talk about um, things that you've seen that help to maximize folks' uh, employer ERC credits? So as I said, it's it. We really we look at the payroll records person by person and uh, maximize where the wages go. It's um, it's a maximum of tenth of what I looked at this morning. People were so high paid that you could tell we were doing a 2020 credit. You could tell that every one of those people had ten thousand dollars worth of wages, and and we were finished. Um, it's going to be harder when you're maximizing the ERC and you have PPP covered periods in 2021 because then you have 10,000 per quarter. And it'll usually be the higher paid workers that end up being uh, included in your PPP um, loan forgiveness and the lower paid workers end up in the ERC. But it, it is an individual by individual look. Yeah, most important again, just to recap is, if you've got PVP and ERC, maximize the credit by minimizing the amount of PVP that covers wages. And then the amount that does, um, we will work to allocate it PVP coverage to higher paid individuals so we don't zero any one employee out by coverage because each individual employee calculates it contributes to an individual credit calculation. So if you're just looking at your, you know, your wages as a sort of full number, not looking at employee by employee, you're gonna seriously potentially um, not maximize your ERC. And that's one of the things that worries me when people just use their payroll provider. Payroll providers just say, tell us whether you want these wages to be for ERC, we'll calculate the number for you. But invariably when that happens, they're not maximizing what goes to PPP loan forgiveness and what goes to the wages. So the last part here, it's more, we'll leave this as a, a takeaway and think piece in terms of what you want to get your, what the audience out there wants to get their uh, mind around when it comes to how to approach talking with us or talking with the provider or just themselves about how to how to look at the ERC. Think about what your control group is. The organization charts are things that we often look at from a company perspective, specifically in the PE context. Identifying that number of full-time employees across, again, we're looking at the entire controlled group when we do these calculations. So. If you own multiple businesses that are all commonly controlled, unlike PPP, think about the fact that you're gonna to have to look at those gross receipts calculations and employee counts all together. Um, gross receipts and government mandates, we've talked about it quite a bit, but again, we're gonna be doing that at the control group level, but you can pull that data together. Government mandates are tougher to pull together, but you can at least pull together and think about a narrative of how you were affected. And then either us, your provider, or whomever can think about what mandates then where you, you kind of know, because you, you, you'll you know, especially back in the mindset of last year, how the government was uh, affecting you. But when it comes to the specific beginning and end dates, that's something we're working with the companies a lot to do to identify that beginning and end period for those orders to make sure we're not claiming it beyond the time that an order was there. And orders are very different than recommendations. So we, we, we are very clear about the fact of what's ordered as opposed, as opposed to what might have been recommended by particular states. Um, People, one thing, Marty, and we haven't yeah. said it, a lot of people say, well, we didn't qualify for PPP2, so I don't think we'll qualify for ERC. Definitely well, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. The PPP2, the PPP loan aggregation rules are small business administration aggregation rules. They're totally different than the Internal Revenue Code rules that apply to the ERC. So if you didn't qualify for PPP2 because of your gross receipts test, it doesn't mean that you're not going to qualify for the ERC. You definitely should look at yeah. your control group for ERC and then see if you qualify. All right. And then I think we have two more slides and we can probably get them quickly, right? Yeah. Uh, so just with respect to data analysis, obviously when we look at, or you look at how you're doing your ERC, take a look at obviously what you got for PPP is going to be important there. So collecting the documentation about what was forgiven for PPP, or if not yet forgiven for 2021, that's important. We can work with you to, again, minimize the amount associated with wages to maximize your ERC. From a wage data perspective, what we're really gathering from companies is a full W-2 feed in an Excel or a CSV type format um, where it's individual by individual by quarter 
with a job title potentially associated um, with an employee number. That's just sort of the basic format that we would get wages for anything. An R&D study would do the exact same thing. But we're doing that in order to look at the amount of credit calculated by quarter so we can appropriately subtract away PPP associated with that quarter um, because the cover period of PPP often spans two quarters. So we're doing math there to make sure that's done appropriately. Um, and filing 941s or 941Xs based on the exact amount of credit calculated per quarter. You can't just do a true up at the end of the year and figure out how much you would have gotten and done a, done a one quarter refund. You have to do it on each individual um, individual 941. So looking at the 941s for clients as well in terms of what they filed previously uh, is important as well. Great. Now, so um, yeah. as we wrap up here, uh, um, it's not too late to go back to 2020 and um, see if a company qualifies, an employer qualifies for ERC in 2020, and it's not too early to be thinking about 2021. Absolutely true. And when the one point we didn't bring up or at least touch on is the fact that in uh, the American Rescue Act, the statute of limitations for the IRS to review these was extended from three years to five years. Maybe we did touch on this, but I want to make it one more time. Um, so the documentation is, is important. The reason why you're an eligible employer is important, whether it's your government mandate specifically cited or the grocery seats, having all of that together is important and having the credits calculated out appropriately by person because these are subject to IRS review. Um, and it is something that, uh, you know, they have time to look at, but you have time as well. Um, 2020 doesn't go away a chance to do that for maybe two more years. You'll have a chance to look back at that if, if you want to. Um, the reason it's important now and timing is important is because people need this money. And so the quicker you can do 2021, the more cash you'll have on hand. The point is to give it to you now to help you uh, keep people on the payroll. Great. Uh, Deb, any, any last comments or uh, covered it all? Well, I'm just looking at some of the questions. The one was, can we have non-consecutive quarters and qualify for the ERTC? You most certainly can. You should be looking at every quarter your gross in 2021 to see whether you've had a 20% decline in that quarter. Yeah, I, I think uh, you guys have addressed the majority of the questions that were uh, that were listed there. So uh, thank you for your attendance today. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Deborah, Deborah for your insights uh, on these issues with uh, the employee retention credit. And as we, as Martin stated, this is just one of many different programs that the government has uh, provided to help companies succeed and uh, recover from the pandemic uh, and we want to make sure that you uh, are taking the best the the best actions to get the most out of your erc credits thank you and uh, reach out to martin and deb if you have any questions and uh, and follow up thank you okay thank you everybody <laughs>